Uh, for those of you who are maybe new here or those of you who aren't new here, we have got a members only time night on September 1st at five o'clock PST. So it's not gonna be a webinar, it's gonna be a meeting. And I was on the internet with my mom yesterday trying to figure this out and we've, we've got it all figured out. So what's gonna happen, it, it is our first one, is I'm gonna be able to see all of you and we're gonna be able to speak with each other. And then I'll have a camera on myself as well as on my fly. And then you'll just pin my video that I'm, I'm using to fly tie and you'll be able to see it all you know, zoomed up. So I'll be sending out to members um, a material list well in advance so that you can get all your materials ready, and then we will tie together. And we're gonna be doing this once a month. We're starting off really easy this, uh, this first session on September 1st, but then I've got some seriously amazing tie, tying presenters lined up. So I've got some guests that are a surprise. And uh, if you're not a member yet, I'll just use this Al, Al's there. Hey. Hey. So How are you? Good, thanks. This is just a big surprise. Al uh, wasn't well, and so we ended up finding a, uh, I guess, a, a substitute teacher. <laughs> Jerry is our substitution. And Al, how's it going? So are you, you're not presenting, Al, are you? No, but it didn't keep me from tuning in. Oh, okay, so we've got, I see, so you'll use the presenter um, link. So, <laughs> Al, what I might do is, oh. um, yeah, that's okay, we can just see you, so I don't know how you feel about that, but um, we will, uh, if you I want to, I can turn that off. that's okay, if you wanted to use the regular link that everyone else is on so that you can, so we don't see you, um, you can just use the other link, or, you can um, stop your video if you don't want us to see you. So you can walk around or um, lounge in your pajamas if you're wearing pajamas. <laughs> <Got it>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. All okay. right. <laughs> so as you can see, it's a bit of a, it's all kind of a bit of a scramble. Um, I was going to make a deal of it, but Al um, ended up getting sick, and we now have Jerry. Jerry, you're amazing for coming on last minute. Thank you. And if you oh, are, no problem. If you're not a member, it's not too late to join. Uh, I'm posting the Czech Nymph Masterclass today and our third masterclass tomorrow. And as I promised, once the first three classes are up, prices are going all the way up to $14.99 a month instead of $4.99 a month. So if you wanted to get on as a member, I strongly advise that you do that now because once the master classes are up, um, prices won't be coming back. But that's it, let's get started. So um, everybody who's been here knows there's a chat. Feel free to use the chat. I will be monitoring that, uh, chatting with all of you. If you have any questions, please wait until the end or you can write them now and we will address them near the end. This is a really important presentation for me anyway because like I mentioned, I want to have this community grow together and become better fly tires together. So Jerry, no pressure. We are relying on you to help open our eyes and our minds to the fly tying and learn how to get started. All right, sounds good. Hey, uh, Al, sorry to hear you're under the weather and uh, get well soon, buddy, okay? Uh, yeah, I'm working on it, right. it won't be long, we're getting there. Okay, sounds good, good, good luck with everything. Uh, the wonderful world of fly tying. Uh, let's take a look at a beginning, uh, beginning uh, overview of it. In April, you know, I was thinking about something today while I was putting some of this together, and this is kind of scary. I've been tying flies longer than you've been on the earth. So, uh, <laughs> Honestly, you've a been, long, long time. You've been fishing for, I mean, how long? 50 years? Well, a long time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 50, over 50 years, yeah. So, I'm not a youngster, but I've, I'm young at heart, I'll leave it like that, okay? Uh, so let's get started here. And, and we're gonna go over basic tools that you need to get going. Uh, and we're gonna see the, uh, the, the steps, the procedure of tying, you know, if you had to pick one fly to start with, uh, the one we're gonna look at is probably the one that you wanna do. So, you know, the heart of tying, fly tying really is having a good vice. Uh, the vice holds the hook 
we need the vise to hold the hook firmly. Uh, <clears throat> and yes, you can tie flies by hand, and it's been done in the past, and it's kind of a novelty thing more than anything else. Uh, it, at this point, you know, make it simple for yourself uh, and, and get yourself a good vise. Uh, don't scrimp on the vise. This is a peak vise, which I know April ties on, which I know Al is very familiar with. Uh, and really, I've been tying on peak vices for probably 25 plus years or so, I think, maybe maybe not quite that long. It's a great product, very well made uh, at, a, at a really good price. So this is a simple, what we would call cam lever action. Uh, basically, we'll see here in a second, in order to lock the hook in place, you just press that lever on the left side down and uh, the hook is held if you have everything adjusted properly. Uh, when you put the hook in the vise, you'll actually see that we do leave a bit of the point exposed so we can get to the back of the hook while we're tying the fly. So we really don't bury the hook point in the vise at all. Uh, and uh, generally, we're gonna keep the hook shank parallel to the, uh, to the tying surface, okay? Uh, this is also a pedestal vise which means it has a heavy base on it. Uh, you can also buy vices that have clamps on them. Uh, if you are gonna clamp it permanently to a table or, or something like that. But I think uh, the majority of people buy pedestal vices just because of the portability of them. Uh, I know when I go on trips, I often take a vice with me. I know you do April, uh, pretty much uh, a lot of hardcore anglers do. So pedestal vice really seems uh, you know, to be the most popular design. Uh, this is a little different version of a pedestal vise. This is called a rotary vise. Uh, with this type of vise here, you can see that the uh, line of the hook shank is in line with the center shaft of the vise. Uh, and with that little handle on the left there, you can uh, really hold the material or thread that you're using stationary and you wrap you turn the handle and that wraps the material and such for you uh, i don't know if that's the best thing for beginners uh, but if you're going to make an investment and get you know a top-notch vice right out of the gate yeah you might want to consider getting a rotary vice of some sort uh, especially if you're doing a lot of trout flies uh, you know these these do come in handy as time savers uh, if you're doing multiple, pat, you know, multiple numbers of a pattern, that type of thing. So the 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 rotary vice does does have you know uh, advantages to it for sure. Usually a little more expensive than that, but again, uh, a lot of really experienced, again, especially trout fishermen, uh, will go and and go for the rotary vice. And here you see that our little cam action is actually reversed on this one here. Uh, but, uh, you know, the hook really mounts the same way. And here's another look at, at that style vise. And you can see there's a little, uh, little thread holder or cradle all the way on the right hand side. And to keep the thread out of the way, if we're wrapping material, uh, we would set, uh, the thread in that, uh, in that little cradle there to hold it. So, uh, here we've got a rotary vise and, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, maybe the most, I'm probably the most popular design, again, especially for the trout fishing crowd. Now, if you're going to do a lot of big flies, uh, you might want to get something that has a little more uh, better holding uh, uh, jaws or just a better mechanism to hold the hook uh, firm for you, because really, it's very annoying if you're trying to tie a fly, put pressure on materials, get things to hold together and the vise is, or the hook is slipping around on the jaws of the vise. So this particular one has a screw lock system where uh, <clears throat> again, you tighten it down and it'll hold uh, probably up to a nine or 10 odd hook, super, super firm. But this would be probably starting off at maybe a size one or size one O hook and uh, all the way up to something super, super big. So uh, this is a specialty type vise for super big flies, but you can see uh, 
everything's almost in line with that center shaft again. So it can be used in a rotary uh, type process also. And, and all three of these vices are peak vices. Uh, again, if you're interested in getting started, you know, make sure that you check out the website. It's a, it, it's a great product uh, and uh, I'm firmly behind it. So moving on to some of the other uh, tools that we, we use. Uh, scissors are certainly uh, a very, very important part of, of fly tying. Uh, you know, they have to be sharp, first of all. Uh, you have to be able to cut thread and materials uh, easily. Uh, you don't want to be sawing on uh, materials, trying to cut them or, or fraying or shredding your thread when you're trying to cut it. You need straight cuts on materials, uh, really, so you can construct the fly properly and, and it comes out the right way. Uh, bottom middle, that's just a basic fine point scissor. Uh, general purpose uh, tying scissor, uh, you know, and you can find these really any great good fly shop or any, uh, you know, specialty shop is going to be able to help you with, in, with that and select uh, the right type of, of scissors. Uh, on the right and left side, we have scissors that are probably for a little more hardcore, heavy duty use. Uh, the ones on the right uh, for reaching in. Uh, you know, from a distance, cutting materials, thinner hairs and such like that. Uh, on the left-hand side, even a, a heavier jawed scissor for cutting stuff like deer hair, uh, deer body hair, and stiffer, heavier hairs like that. Uh, once you advance in tying and you start doing a wider variety of uh, flies with different materials, you're ultimately probably going to invest in two to three sets of scissors at least, uh, possibly more. Uh, and on the top there, we have a fine point curved shank scissor. And I use these a lot, uh, especially tying smaller flies, dry flies and such, uh, where I really need to get in and, and cut uh, closely and cleanly and accurately. Just that little bit of bend in the scissor just makes it easier uh, to maneuver in, in tight places when you need to. Okay, so again, scissors uh, get the best ones you can afford, uh, and I would say the same thing with the vice: get the best one you can afford. Don't buy it twice. Okay, uh, and that's pretty much true on all the tools as, as we come through here and, and look at them. Okay, this interesting looking piece of equipment, it's called a thread bobbin, okay? And again, you can tie flies without a bobbin, uh, but this makes it so much more easier, uh, especially if, you know, your hands are rough, dry skin, you're just gonna shred the thread, you're gonna fray it, and it's just not, not gonna work at all. Uh, this is just a very simple spring design. Uh, where you spread those uh, wire springs out, you slip the thread in there, uh, and the thread is either put, pulled up through the tube in some way, uh, which we'll talk about in just a second here, uh, and uh, you're on your way. Uh, again, depending on whether you're using a, a heavier thread or a lighter thread, you can see there's some different designs in these bobbins here. And uh, several of these also have a ceramic insert all the way through them. Uh, so again, that just reduces wear uh, on the inside of the bobbin tube, uh, especially if you're uh, you know, using a lot of uh, heavy thread or some of the newer synthetics, the Kevlars, uh, those types of threads, the gel spun stuff, which uh, can over a relatively short period of time, if you're tying a lot of flies, can really start to cut right through a, a standard stainless tube. So uh, this is uh, the, the bobbin, which then holds the thread. Okay, we talked a little bit, just briefly, I touched on how do we get uh, the thread through the, the bobbin tube? Well, us old timers essentially just started down 
uh, it, at the bottom of the tube, uh, get it in there a quarter inch or so, and then take the top end of the tube and suck on it like a straw uh, in that. So uh, I'm not sure that's, <laughs> you know, maybe the way you want to do it all the time, but you know, that just kind of force a habit. And uh, I think a lot of, again, the old time tires uh, still do that. Uh, but that uh, gadget up on the top there is called the bobbin threader. And all it is is a, uh, a loop of wire that's fixed uh, at one end. And that slides down through uh, the bobbin tube. You run the thread through that and pull it back out and the bobbin is threaded. Uh, and you can use monofilament, a uh, little bit tougher to get through, but you know, stiffer, thin wire. Uh, you know, it's very easy to make a very simple uh, uh, bobbin threader yourself if you want to. But, uh, you know, there's, again, a number of different types available commercially, and they are, are not particularly expensive either. So, uh, again, a very handy tool to have, uh, and it'll save you a lot of time as you're working. All right, another uh, interesting looking. Uh, piece of equipment here. Uh, these are called hackle pliers. Okay. Uh, in fly tying, a feather is generally referred to as a hackle, uh, especially if it's wrapped around the hook uh, as either uh, to aid in flotation as in dry flies or as part of the body as you know we see in certain uh, types of, uh, of flies also. Uh, and again, these are usually just a bent metal of some sort, uh, and they have a rubber pad on one side to help hold uh, the feather when you're uh, when you're wrapping it. Uh, and again, there's different sizes of these uh, for different size flies, for different size feathers. Uh, and again, if you stick around and you make fly tying part of your usual uh, fishing activity, uh, you know, you'll probably end up with several different uh, pairs of hackle pliers too. Uh, and, and April, as I'm going through here, if you think I'm missing something, don't be afraid to speak up, okay? Yeah, uh, you're so, adding things that I wouldn't have thought to add, so thank you. Okay, so uh, anyhow, uh, so again, those are hackle pliers. Use these you know, on a very, very regular basis. There's, you know, a few other tricks and stuff you can do uh, with them as far as other tying things, uh, you know, but again, this, that's kind of getting a little bit beyond, you know, just uh, seeing the basics in that. But uh, so again, this is a key piece of equipment, uh, especially if you're going to be doing, doing, doing trout flies or wrapping any type of feathers, okay? Hackle pliers. Okay. Another interesting set of uh, things here. Uh, so when we wrap a or when we tie a fly, as we see here shortly, most of the time you're going to start at the back end uh, near the bend of the hook and you work your way forward. The thread is continuously wrapped. Uh, we don't cut it and splice it, uh, piece it together uh, at all on a regular basis. Okay. Uh, and when we reach the eye of the hook and we're getting ready to finish the fly off, all the materials are on and we need to uh, uh, you make the thread really so it doesn't unwrap itself. Uh, there's a few different ways, again, and different tools that are used for this. The simplest of these is just by putting a half hitch uh, uh, in the thread, and this is just a wrap of the thread over itself to keep it from unwrapping. And you can put a series of half hitches in at the head of the fly. Uh, it's, it's really the simplest way to get started. Uh, series of half hitches and a little bit of cement and the fly you know, should stay together uh, reasonably well for you. So we'll see this in use here uh, in a little bit but these are made generally out of uh, uh, aluminum, uh, brass, you know, some type of metal. 
they have a taper on them so uh, that actually the thread will slide off and we'll see this put in practice here shortly. Uh, they're usually not made out of plastic. Uh, you know, certain types of plastic, especially once you get around hair or feathers, uh, create static electricity. And you can wrap hair and feather fibers down when you're trying to finish the fly off. Uh, and it, you know, it just adds more uh, frustration into to doing this uh, uh, type of work. So. Uh, these half-hitch tools are generally going to be made out of metal of some sort. And you can see here, uh, you know, we, different size hooks will have different size hook eyes uh, in that. So the half-hitch tools are usually sold in a set uh, of uh, two or three with different diameters. And even each end of the, the, the tool will have a different diameter on it. So uh, it can fit on a super wide range of, uh, uh, of hook eyes. So that is uh, a half hitch tool. And again, uh, this is something you'll use regularly, especially as a beginner. Uh, and as your uh, skills uh, develop, uh, you may move on to a different type of uh, uh, thread wrapping tool that we'll, uh, again, we'll look at here in just a second. So here's a, uh, you know, kind of a combination tools. We'll see. We'll see some of these start to come into the mix. Uh, the one on top is a, a, a dubbing brush, uh, and again, it has a little what we call a dubbing needle uh, on the uh, on the end of it. Uh, and when you're working with uh, different furs, uh, in particular, uh, we'll often comb or brush those out, uh, and it makes them super translucent in the water. It gives a very lifelike look to them. So uh, a, a very fine bristle brush uh, is often used. And you can see that one there. I've, I've certainly put some time in with that one because the bristles are just full of, uh, uh, of you know, fur residue there. Uh, and you can do somewhat the same thing with, uh, with the needle end of it. Uh, but, you know, the needle end works best for, you know, trying to pull individual feather fibers uh, or, uh, uh, you know, furs or hairs or something if they get wrapped down by the thread and you need to, uh, to try and get them out uh, and, and in the right position. And the other thing often, uh, the needle is used to dip in uh, some sort of like a, uh, a cement, a liquid cement or something like that. If we uh, want to add a little bit uh, in the process of tying the fly to help maybe strengthen a point or to wrap uh, the head of, or the eye of the fly when we're completed with it to help protect the thread. Uh, and down below that, again, uh, a needle type tool, but this one has a half hitch tool built into the end of it. Okay, so uh, a lot of these uh, multi purpose tools are, are found in, uh, in tying and uh, again, as, as you go through uh, and learn more about it and get more experience, you'll, you'll find ones that may suit your need. Uh, not everyone is going to need these, but, you know, we need to be aware that, uh, that they're out there and available. Uh, yeah, and, real quick, sorry to interrupt you. That peak pick in your last slide. Yep. That I love it so much that when I was, when I had fly gal, I used to sell those on the site. Al, I don't know if you guys still sell them, but that thing there, and I've tried them all, and I've tried toothbrushes, barbecue brushes, gun cleaners, you name it, but the way right. that, that is all set up and just for ease of use and the way that you can grab it and hold it, it's just, I can't recommend that tool enough. Yeah, that, that thing is awesome. And you know, with that, that flat side on it, just so easy to, to hold it and, uh, uh, and control it. And, uh, those of you that are not familiar with fly tying may think it seems odd that we're so excited about a little piece of equipment like that. But uh, if you really do a lot of this uh, and you'll just find a, a really cool piece of equipment or piece of gear like this that really makes things a lot easier for you. And this is just one of those that, that fits into that category. Whoops, going the wrong way here. Sorry about that. Okay, so again, multi 
multi-use tools. Again, there we've got a needle and half hitch tool. And up above there, we've got a needle with a dubbing or with a uh, bobbin threader built into it. Okay, so, you know, a lot of these tools are combined into two or three uh, uses. And, and again, as you go through and, and learn to tie, you'll find the ones that suit you best. Okay. Uh, you know, other useful tools, a nice fine point tweezer for doing multiple things, uh, picking up small hooks. Uh, if you're familiar with beadhead uh, nymph flies, picking up beads that are laying on, uh, on the table, on your timetable. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, just a multitude of different things that uh, a little uh, fine pair of tweezers like this uh, will, uh, will do for you. And of course, on the bottom, just a nice, simple, flat, uh, flat jaw plier uh, that we use to pinch barbs down with. Okay. Uh, and, you know, pinching down the barb is, you know, just something that I almost automatically do anymore. Uh, in most situations, uh, because it just the hook actually penetrates better, and it's so much easier to get out, uh, uh, especially on a windy day when cast blows a fly into your ear or something like that. Uh, quick removal, uh, minimal amount of pain. Uh, but again, I don't think there is really a negative, uh, hardly ever, uh, as far as pinching down a barb uh, from a fishing standpoint. Uh, just because the hook penetrates so much uh, easier and generally will go in deeper than a, a barbed hook too. So tweezer, uh, some sort of a plier to pinch down barbs uh, and you're, you know, uh, you've got that covered. Uh, okay, so what is this crazy looking combination of things here? All right, uh, we mentioned that, you know, the half hitch tool is, is great it works well for beginners to tie off the head of the fly. Well, there is a tool uh, that's called a whip finisher. Uh, and here's the two main variations of that tool. Uh, what this allows is us for make, to easily make multiple wraps of thread over itself uh, in a continuous uh, motion. Uh, so you can do four or five, six wraps uh, of the thread over itself at the hook eye. And really, especially on smaller flies, uh, you do one or two of those multi wraps like that, you really don't need to worry about any cement or lacquer or anything at the head of the fly. It's, it's secured and you know, nothing's gonna happen to it. Whereas, you know, the half hitch, uh, you know, one or two half hitches can come loose at times, especially, uh, you know, if the fly is getting chewed up a little bit, you've caught a number of fish or uh, even sometimes from casting, uh, you know. So this is something that you want to learn. Uh, and this would be, you know, after the first couple dozen flies that you tie, then start to learn how to whip finish, okay? But get your basic techniques down first. Uh, get a few flies under your belt. Uh, go catch a couple fish on them to gain some confidence. And then, you know, start stepping up the ladder. Uh, the other thing about the whip finisher is, is it, it makes a very nice neat, uh, not uh, at the head of the fly, whereas especially with heavier thread, a series of whip finishes, or I'm sorry, a series of half hitches can start to get fairly bulky in that too. Uh, so that's called a whip finishing tool. And uh, as you gain knowledge in Again, you start tying better flies, you'll want to uh, learn how to use this. Uh, and there's a million YouTube videos on how to do this with the whip finish. You want to, April, I don't know if you're gonna go over it at all and in your classes, I'm sure you are, okay. Uh, so you'll learn how to use this as you get, you know, a little farther down the road, okay? Okay, we're just kind of looking at a few things here, looking the vise. This is how we start the thread. We pull a few inches of uh, thread out uh, and just grab it by the, uh, with your fingertips. 
And I'm actually going from the back of the hook. Uh, that's the way I learned how to do it. Uh, and that's the way I've always done it. Some people will push from, actually push from the front of the hook to start the thread. I pull uh, from behind the hook to start the thread. Uh, I'm pulling on the thread bobbin. Uh, and you can see I've got the bobbin held down below the tube. Don't hold it all the way up on top because your fingers get in the way and you can't see what's going on. Okay, so try and hold uh, the bobbin down uh, at the bottom of the tube, a couple inches of thread out, and you're pulling with both your right and left hand, a little bit of tension so that everything's tight. You're gonna make some wraps of the thread and take it back over itself. Okay, so you're gonna wrap a couple times to lock it or get it started. And then you're gonna wrap the thread back over itself in order to secure it. Okay. At that point, you can just let the bobbin hang. We take our scissors and uh, clip down close to the top of the hook shank and you're ready to roll. You're ready to start tying the fly. So that's starting the thread right there. Easy thing to do, but a lot of people seem to have difficulty with it. Uh, keeping tension on the thread when you're wrapping is really the key thing to it. Okay. And practice wrapping up and down the shank of the hook a few times. Uh, as you're wrapping with those spring tension bobbins, you might have to just unroll a little bit of thread as you're, uh, as you're tying. Don't try and pull it right off, because again, if the thread's real thin uh, and, there's a little, and there's a fair amount of tension on the bobbin, you can break the thread. But this is good practice. Just go up and down the hook shank. Get used to how much tension you can put on a particular thread you're using. Uh, you know, see how much tension it takes to actually get the thread off the bobbin. So this is just all practice stuff that uh, you can do a couple minutes each time session, uh, but a good way to get started and really get familiar with uh, the equipment that you have to work with. Uh, and again, this is a half hitch tool in use, uh, the thread, the tool is laid on the thread. The thread is wrapped around uh, the tool to the, uh, actually towards the end of the, the half hitch tool. And we just slide, keeping tension on the thread, we slide uh, the opening of the tool up to the hook eye. And again, keeping tension, just pull that off just like that. So there we have a half hitch uh, that's been completed. You can usually get away with doing two wraps of thread uh, and it'll slide off for you. Any more than that, uh, you often run into difficulties. But uh, finishing off, again, uh, the fly getting started. Wrap thread up and down the shank a few times, get used to the tension on the thread, how much you can put on. Uh, you know, feel what the bobbin looks like in your hand. And, and again, uh, the thing about the simplicity of the half hitch tool to get started with, uh, you're laying the tool on the thread, uh, you're wrapping the thread uh, around uh, the tool under tension, uh, and putting the open end of the tool over the hook eye and just slowly pulling it off and you've got a single wrap of thread over itself you can do that multiple times uh, you can do probably two wraps of thread with the half hitch tool and uh, you know it's going to hold together for you okay uh, if you want to work with the whip finisher also there's not a problem with that but again some people get it some people don't so this is a sure way, uh, really, to be able to, to tie off uh, the, at the head of the fly, okay? So, uh, you know, we've, we've kind of started a fly, uh, saw how to start the thread, we've seen how to finish the thread. So now we're gonna look at all the, uh, some of the stuff that, that happens in between. And that's all finished off there. So, from a freshwater fishing standpoint, uh, 
a trout for trout, you know, even bass, panfish, that type of stuff. <clears throat> uh, you'd be pretty hard pressed to find a better fly to start with than uh, than a woolly bugger. Uh, this fly was originally designed in Pennsylvania by a fellow by the name of Russell Blessing. Uh, it was originally tied with a black tail, olive body, and uh, black uh, a black hackle feather uh, to imitate a Helgramite or Dobson fly larva, uh, which is a very tasty large morsel that both trout and particularly smallmouth bass love to eat. Uh, but since then, this this flies morphed into all kinds of different things just by varying the size uh, and color of it. The great thing about this from a beginner standpoint is you learn multiple things uh, and it's a fly that's not very complex, uh, it's not technically difficult to tie, and often the uglier it is the better it works. Okay, uh, Also a good steelhead fly too. Uh, you know, so you can catch a lot of different things with, with this particular fly. Uh, so when you're learning these different patterns or you look in a magazine, uh, you look online, you'll often find the recipe. So just like we have recipes in a cookbook to make something, we have recipes for uh, tying flies. And really the whole key, I think, to a, a beginner type program is for the student to be able to have a sample of the fly, look at that recipe, and know how to assemble that fly. Okay, uh, and again, this fly is just so good because it teaches so much of that, and it catches fish too. Uh, you know, we're not going to get really into any detail on on hooks or anything like that at this point. We could spend, you know, a couple hours just doing that. The same thing with threads and that, but just be aware that this is, again, the parts that make up a fly like this. And we're just gonna look at, you know, really some of the basic techniques on, on how we put it together. So I threw a little bit of something different into the mix here too. This is uh, if we wanna weight flies and often we'll weight streamer patterns. There's a number of ways to do that. You know, this was the original way to do it, the way I learned. And here I've got my thread started about the middle uh, of the hook shank there. Uh, this is some weighted wire. Uh, you can, you know, lead is, is not really used anymore. So a, a non-lead type substitute. And if you're gonna wrap this type of material to, uh, to help weight the fly, you'll generally keep it on the front half of the fly and it'll be easiest to wrap by using uh, a wire either the same diameter or slightly less than what the hook shank is. If it's too too big in diameter, it just becomes very cumbersome and difficult to wrap uh, around the hook. So uh, really this wire has been wrapped around. Uh, it's got some thread wraps over it to hold it in place and such as we see there. And so we've got that done and we're going right back to the uh, bend of the hook uh, to start the tying process. Now, if this was a floating fly, a dry fly, something like that, we would not put any type of weight in with it because we want that fly to float. Okay? But with you know a lot of these, uh, even uh, subsurface patterns, nymph streamers, and that will often add a little bit of, of weight to them. And, and you'll see where I've got the thread started uh, at, at the back end of the hook. Uh, it's right where the bend starts, and this is often at a point midway between the barb and the point of the hook. Okay, so that's kind of a good general rule on how far do I want my thread back when I start to tie the fly. And this holds true really on, on just about any style of hook in just about any size that you can think of. So the tail of this fly is a material called marabou. Uh, marabou is, is these days, it's down from a turkey, uh, which they can get in huge quantities. Uh, 
Uh, it can be dyed in multiple colors. Uh, it's, a, it's just a very uh, lifelike material in the water, soft, has all kinds of movement to it. Uh, and uh, it comes in a single feather uh, or plume uh, generally, and, and that's how we use it. And here I'm gauging the length that I want to tie in. On this particular fly, we're going to tie in the tail approximately the length of the hook shank. That keeps everything in proportion. So I've got that measured. And then what I do is I slide that back where I started to thread. I'm going to make a series of wraps over uh, the material to hold it in place. And any of the excess uh, will just be trimmed away from the front. Okay. And, and again, this, the step, the process in putting a tail in a lot of flies is very, very similar to this. Uh, the, the way you do it is the same, the material might be different. So what you find in tying is that these different steps are often the same, but you know, we're using a different material to do it. But once you learn these basic uh, steps or the basic procedures, uh, the way the flies are tied, it, it, it carries over to just about everything you do. Okay? So you're not learning something totally new uh, every time. So the tail on this is, is tied in. And if we want to add a little uh, extra flash in on this, there's multiple flash uh, materials on, on the market. This is a, a, a mirror, a crinkled mirror flash, I think it is, or lateral scale, something like that. Uh, and it doesn't have to be put in this uh, fly, but you'll see this material added in multiple patterns. Uh, so again, we're going to see the way this material is normally tied in, and this will carry over to a lot of different things that you're going to tie in the course of your tying career. So I've pulled out several strands of this material, uh, trimmed it off. It, it comes on a big hank. Uh, I've laid it down so that, oh, it extends a little bit past the tail, but you can see I've tied it down in the middle. Okay, so this stuff is super, super slippery. Okay, and we want to really secure it and lock it in there. So I've tied it down in the middle and I'm going to pull it back and then wrap over it again. And that is totally locked in position now. It is never going to pull out. Uh, if you just tried to tie in a few pieces right at the thread there without doing that, you know, wrapping back, uh, chances are they wouldn't be in there too long. So most any of these flash materials that you're going to use are often, the majority of the time, tied in the same way, okay? Whether it be at the front of the fly, at the back of the fly, but you're usually gonna wrap and pull back like that to really lock it in position. Again, just because it's, it's so slick and slippery. And, and you'll notice here too that everything on this is going to be tied in to create the fly and it's gonna stay at the same point uh, until we get the materials tied in. So we've got the tail completed. If there's any excess material sticking out too far, uh, we can trim it in to approximately the length of the, uh, of the marabou. And here I'm going to prepare the hackle. Okay, again, as we mentioned before, a hackle is a feather uh, that we wrap uh, around the hook. Uh, generally, they're from some kind of a, again, a chicken, some kind of a game bird. But if the hackle's wrapped around uh, the hook, uh, it, uh, I mean, if the feather's wrapped around the hook, it's called a hackle, okay? And, and here you can see that these taper from a wider, what we call butt section, to thinner at the tip section, okay? The, the fibers are a different length as you go uh, down the feather. Uh, and again, this varies from, fly to fly or what type of fly you're tying, uh, you know, how that feather is exactly tied in. Uh, for this particular fly, uh, this is the way that uh, I think most people prefer to do it, where we tie it in at the tip section here uh, before we wrap it. Okay, so I'm just kind of showing the feather there. Uh, and 
you can see now I've created, uh, I pulled back some of the fibers, left some forward and kind of create a notch there. Uh, and that notch is laid down right over top of the tail in the flash material. And I wrap the thread at that notch, secure it in place. Uh, and uh, any of the excess or as much of the excess as I can clear out is, is trimmed off uh, uh, so it's not sticking out to the front. And at this point, everything is, is behind sticking out to the back of the fly. So the next material we're gonna put in or the next part of the fly is, is the body. And this is gonna be with chenille. Uh, chenille is kind of like a pipe cleaner, but not a wire core to it. it it's a thread core. Uh, so this wraps really, really easily. Uh, most of this is made out of rayon, uh, I believe, you know, at present. And again, there's all kinds of different types of this chenille material on the market. Uh, what I've done is I've taken my thumb and uh, uh, index finger of my right hand and just stripped some of the fibers off uh, from the core of the material there to just expose some of that bare thread. And I've tied that in uh, and everything is secured. Uh, I've uh, uh, nothing trimmed everything that's sticking out away from the front. So all the pieces, parts of this fly are, are there now and ready uh, to be wrapped. Uh, and again, as said earlier, we're, we're starting from the back and working our way forward. So I've now advanced the thread up to behind the eye of the hook. And don't go straight up to the eye of the hook, okay? especially when you're starting out. You want to leave yourself some room to work with. Big mistake beginners always make is they crowd the eye of the hook and they don't have room to tie the stuff off. Okay, and you end up just with a big ugly glob of material there. So if you do anything, err on uh, leaving it a little bit more space there than maybe you think it should. But you wanna, you know, leave yourself room to tie everything forward. So chenille's out of the back, uh, the hackle's sticking out the back, the tail's in, uh, and what we're going to do is, is form the body of the fly. Okay, so just uh, I'm going to wrap the chenille, kind of passing it from one hand to the other as I go forward. Uh, try and, you know, make the body nice and even looking. Uh, you know, you don't want a lot of big lumps or anything like that. You know, try and get it as even looking as you can. You may find that uh, you know, maybe making two wraps forward and then one wrap over the top will help you even things out. Uh, you'll just have to play with this a little bit, especially as you start out uh, in just getting familiar with the chenille. And you can get fine, real thin chenille, uh, a medium size, and then really big wide chenilles too. Uh, most of the time you're gonna use a medium, especially for a fly like this, which is normally tied on anything from say a number four to a six, eight book is probably the general sizes on these. So again, the material is just wrapped forward uh, towards the hook eye. And you know, no space in between the wraps or anything like that. You get up close to uh, the hook eye there where the thread's hanging down. You're gonna make uh, a couple wraps of thread over that chenille to lock it in place. And then, you know, I would do three, four wraps anyhow to make sure it's secure. And then you're going to just trim the chenille short and try to push the bobbin out of the way when you're doing that, okay? Uh, otherwise, you run the risk of cutting the thread. And I know none of us ever do that, right? April, we never do that. Uh, but you can minimize that happening by pushing uh, the thread and bobbin out of the way with, uh, uh, with your hand. Uh, that would be in this case with my left hand uh, while I'm getting ready to trim with the right hand there. Okay. So again, you can see we've got a nice, uh, nice clean uh, tie down there. 
uh, in a nice clean cut, give it a few extra wraps to secure it uh, in place. Uh, and here's a, a spot where if you wanted to maybe add a little more security with that, you could put a half hitch in there. Okay, just again, that's going to lock that thread in case you put some slack in it or anything like that. You know, so uh, there's some people that will kind of in between each step like that put a dab of cement on it too. Uh, you know, uh, they want the fly to be indestructible, okay, and that's one way to do it. Now, that's again taking things to an extreme, but you can do stuff like that, okay. Uh, it's just totally up to the individual. So the body is formed on this fly, uh, and that was a multicolored chenille called variegated, uh, and you can see it kind of gives a nice look to it. Uh, uh, again, depending on what you're trying to imitate or simulate, you can find chenille in just about any color scheme uh, that you can think of. Uh, but again, uh, an all black woolly bugger is probably the most popular color that there is, and that'll catch fish anyway. Okay, now we're wrapping our, our feather forward uh, at this point. And with this fly, we're just going to space the wraps out evenly uh, up the body. Uh, this feather is, is big enough and long enough. I don't even need a hackle plier to, to use it at this point. Uh, but each time I wrap around, I'm going to kind of pull back a little bit and kind of get any fibers there to, to really start to stick out a little. Uh, so we really want those out and spread out around the body because this really gives the fly a really good swimming look, a lot of movement in the water. Uh, and the feather is just wrapped up around uh, the body there till we get up to the hook guy or just short of the hook guy where the thread's hanging, okay? Uh, then we tie off uh, the rest of that feather, trim it, and you can see at that point we've got, you know, a few uh, a few fibers here and there sticking out. Uh, and you know, if we want to try and make it a little nicer looking, uh, what I'm going to do there is kind of pull everything back. Ooh, not a great picture there. Sorry about that. A little fuzzy, but pull all that stuff back. Uh, those fibers back behind the eye and just make a few wraps of thread back and forth trying to create a, a little neater looking head there uh, and then uh, at that point we can either use our half hitch or whip finish uh, to tie the thread off trim it and we've finished our first fly okay uh, so that's what I got, you know. Uh, you know, we kind of went through, I think, the basic tools. Uh, really, what we went through is stuff you really need to get started. As you get into time, you'll find that there is a lot more, you know, tools uh, that you can work with. And depending on what style of flies, like if you get into like deer hair, bass bugs, and things like that, you, you add a whole other uh assortment of things into the mix but for these basic style trout flies you know what we did uh i think uh you know covered the main things that you have to do but again the, the great thing about this particular fly here that that we looked at the steps on is uh you're 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 learning how to tie in the tail uh we're learning a little bit about how to lock in these flashing materials uh, by tying the feather in by the tip, those fibers kind of are oriented to the back a little bit. You know, they kind of cup towards the rear. Now, if I would have tied the feather in by the butt end or the heavy end, those fibers would be facing forward a little bit. And you can do the fly either way. Uh, probably the fish don't really care. I mentally, I think, in my mind, this fly should be tied this way. Uh, I think it just has a more streamlined uh, look to it. And, and one thing you'll find is there's no shortage of opinions when it comes to fly tying, as in all aspects of fly fishing. Uh, the other thing, too, is getting started. Ugh, I always get asked about should I get a kit all the time? Uh, 
<laughs> my opinion is no. Uh, you should get the best vice and tools that you can afford and pick one pattern to learn. Get yourself a couple dozen hooks and enough material to tie that pattern. And once you get that down and you've got your basic techniques down, then you can start expanding. Okay. The problem with kits is they give you a, a hundred hooks with you know all kinds of different materials and you immediately want to learn how to use all of them and you really don't learn how to often don't learn how to do anything well so get good tools and and pick a pattern uh get a good tools in a in a good vice uh, and then learn to tie a pattern like a woolly bugger which you're going to be able to use anyhow uh and it's going to teach you a lot of different techniques very quickly that's great advice yeah okay this is so good, Jerry. I'm so happy. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it worked out and I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope that everybody uh, enjoyed it and learned something. There's a lot to learn. Let's go through some questions if that's okay. Sure. Uh, Joseph has said, I am wanting to acquire a second bobbin. Specifically, I've been looking at a Loon ergonomic bobbin product for roughly $20. In your opinion, would this be a good choice or do you have any other recommendations? If possible, I would like to keep costs around $20. I typically use both 6 aught, 8 aught, and on occasion 10 aught threads for the flies that I put. Uh, you know, I think the new stuff that's out from Loon is awesome. Uh, I think uh, that's probably a very usable uh, and, and good bobbin to have, especially if you're going to be using lighter threads like that and you can make adjustments and stuff easily. Uh, the spring bobbins, like I showed, again, are basic getting started ones. And the thing about them is you can change threads super, super quickly uh, if you need to. Uh, some of the other ones, there's a little bit more in, involved with them. In the casual tire, it may not make a difference, but uh, you know, if you're trying to crank out a bunch of flies and stuff like that, you know, time does make a difference to a certain extent. Uh, I mean, I probably have on my tying desk, there's probably 15 bobbins loaded right now. So, I mean, I just have a bunch of bobbins with different threads that I use a lot. So, uh, but that's an accumulation of, uh, you know, several years of doing this too. But uh, just, you know, short answer to her question, I think that's a good choice, yes. Stan wants to know, and this is a loaded question, Stan. Is there any advantage to using more or less tackle? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, Just open this can right now. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, good thing I can't show you my tying room, I guess, you know, so. Uh, but, you know, you can keep things like anything else. You can keep it super, super simple, uh, or it can become a lifelong obsession like it has uh, like it has for me uh, again this fly we just tied here you can go anywhere in the world and catch trout on it okay is it going to be the best fly all the time no but are you going to be in the ball game most of the time yes okay so uh, I'm going to use that is is part of my answer uh, uh, and it depends on you know if you're just going to be a streamer fisherman, you don't need, you know, a, a big assortment of flies probably. You need a few different patterns and a few different colors and a few different sizes. Uh, but if you're gonna try and get yourself uh, to have the best, uh, to do the best or most effective techniques no matter where you go, then you're gonna expand your assortment of stuff. Uh, so I guess it, it boils down to the individual is, you know, uh, you know, how much do you want to invest in it? How much, uh, how much do you want to carry around with you? You know, all that kind of stuff. But uh, if you focus on one style of fishing, one style of fly fishing, obviously you'll need less gear. And Stan, if you're, if you're asking in the fly, because that question could be, um, it, it could be either or. If you mean more or less hackle in the fly, that's going to depend on what you're fishing for, 
what kind of hackle you're using, how big your fly is, are you trying to get down? Uh -oh. Yeah, I personally like to have less hackle, but use techniques that make it look like I have more if I'm trying to have it have body in the water. So that's dependent on the, the fly, in my opinion, anyway. Okay, if, if, my ex, if my answer sounded really bizarre, it was because I misunderstood. <laughs> I a, thought you said tackle with a T. Oh, tackle. Not, <laughs> sorry. It's uh, anyway. Not tackle with an H. Uh, More or less tackle. So there's two answers. <laughs> Three answers, technically, <laughs> for your question. Um, so we've, uh, co we've covered a lot of different things in one question. We have. Um, could you tell us what to look for when selecting marabou? Yes, I can. And especially if this is in reference to our class on September, or our session on September 1st. Um, I personally like to have a blood pool marabou. And what that means is, so when you're going to take it out of the package, and you should do this with most of your feathers, open them up like a deck of cards, give them a little shake and even up. Just a little blow so that they move and separate. Blood pool of marabou has got, it's quite long, like so, and it's got a really long stem that gets very thick at the bottom. But you'll notice that at the top, it gets really, really thin. The plumage is super thin, almost like what you see in Jerry's fly here. You see at the tail of this woolly bugger, that, that tail has marabou that looks very similar to a blood pool of marabou. But there is also uh, woolly bugger, marabou and that's kind of the stuff that's wavy and um, what I call fluffy. It looks really great in tails but it's not going to work great for what we're doing when we tie our marabou leech because we're going to be hackling the leech, uh, the marabou all the way up and so in that case we don't want it to be really fluffy and um, full of unnecessary material. So in answer to your question, try to find blood quill marabou. If you can't find it and you can only find trout, woolly bugger, marabou, that's totally fine. Just take it out of the package, give it a little blow, and try to get the one that's got the, the marabou that's got the longest stems and the longest, straightest fibers at the top. I hope that that makes sense. And Jerry, if you want to add anything, please feel free. No, that's, you know, that, those are the two main types that you run across for sure. Uh, and if you're wrapping it as a hackle, you need the, the longer, uh, you know, the blood quills in there. And, uh, you know, with the woolly bugger, you know, you can, you've got a lot more that, you, a lot of different, a uh, lot more that you can use for the tails on those. So it's yeah. much, you know, it's not near as critical as, you know, for what you're talking about. Yeah. See, the thing with the blood pool marabou is the, on the long feathers, it's nice and stringy up top. Um, and I even use it sometimes to substitute like heron or really expensive, hard to acquire materials. But if you want to have a nice fluffy tail down at the bottom, near the thick part of the stem, you do get that fluffy marabou. So you can still just peel that off and use that in the tails of your holy bugger. So personally, I think it's better bang for your buck. Uh, Keith, can I review where to go register for membership? Yeah. So if you just go to anchoredoutdoors.com, uh, I think there's a, it depends if you're on your mobile or your desktop, but there's a sign up button. And basically what it's gonna automatically do is give you a free three day trial. You're more than welcome to cancel before your payment kicks in in three days. But then on the, at the end of day three, you're going to be automated into uh, a monthly option. You can opt out at any time, but why this matters is because if you wait for the three-day trial to finish, you will get an automated link giving you access to our master classes, which honestly, I think you'd be mad not to hop in on for $4.99 because we've got some stellar master classes coming. The check nipping one that I was uploading till three o'clock in the morning last night has got three different chapters on fly tying. So if you're a trout angler, Clint not only covers how to check nymph, why to check nymph, all the gear that you need, but he also will walk you through three different flies to tie uh, to be efficient with your check nymphing. So hopefully that answers your question. Just go to anchor.doris.com and you'll be able to sign up there. And also um, when these next classes are up, so tomorrow or the next day um, for our third class up and prices go up, um, the monthly option is going to be gone for all new members. So those of you who are on now or who get on before it changes, you are able to be locked in on your monthly rate but for everyone else, it's going to be an annual option only. So um, I would advise if you are watching this now that you and you're and you're interested in the membership, hop on now, check it out, 
worst case scenario, cancel in a couple of weeks and it's cost you $4.99 to see if you like the, um, the services and the programs that we're offering. So that's that. Um, any other, oh, Drew, if you would join the membership, does that include the fly time groups? Yeah, so the fly time groups were an idea from Andrew Jennings. Andrew, I don't know if you're still on here, but Andrew's a member and he had sent me an email when he first hopped on a few months ago and he was like, hey, have you thought about doing these members only time nights? And I just thought it would be a nice, extra service. Plus, I really love the community that's growing and you guys keep seeing me, but I don't get to see you. So I thought that time nights would be great for us to pour a drink together, hang out together, and just kind of get to know each other better and laugh and tie flies with really cool instructors. So that's uh, Anchored Outdoors. Any other questions for Jerry? Al, I don't know if you're both still on there, but both of you guys have got excellent uh, books that will help people with their flies. Do you want to just give me a plug quickly, Jerry, as well as you, Al, on where people can find your stuff? Uh, yeah, I've got three books. Uh, well, actually, two on the market now and, and a new one coming out in October uh, that deal mainly with, you know, the Midwest and Great Lakes area. Uh, but I'm really covering anything from, you know, trout to apex predators like pike and muskie and, and things like that with the stuff I have. One is uh, uh, Fly Fishing the Inland Oceans, uh, about the Great Lakes. Uh, one is just a beginner's guide to bass and panfish. And uh, the third book I have coming out, which will be out in October, uh, is Fly Patterns of the Great Lakes and Midwest, which covers uh, quite a bit of history up to the present time. Uh, and has over, I think we counted about 550 patterns with photos and recipes and anecdotal info and things like that. And your local fly shop can get any of those for you. Uh, should be available on Amazon too. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Al, your time is one of the first Just let us know about yeah. it. <clears throat> um, my book is called uh, 25 Best Most Versatile Flies. It's uh, through Stonefly Press. Uh, it's probably available on Amazon. Uh, you could email me at my website, Alrit Flies, and uh, we'll have copies of it too. Uh, the title's a little bit deceptive. There's actually, I believe, 89 different fly patterns in there, but they're derivatives of 25 uh, basic flies. Uh, and the um, the point of the book was really to give you some history on the development of the flies, how they were developed, uh, what spun off of what, and how you can adapt flies to different uses. So we're not talking about trout flies or bass flies or pike flies. We're talking about how you can take a set of tying skills uh, and popular flies and use them in different applications. And there are about 1,300 step-by-step -step photos on tying the flies to. That's awesome. It's just a beautiful book. Um, I've got one last question. Sorry, Mary Beth has a good point. We didn't explain types of hooks, um, dry versus nymph, one, just streamer hooks, all of that. This is a, a big question that we could spend hours discussing. Do you just want to kind of give us a basic breakdown about hooks, Jerry? Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> Boy, uh, let's see, how do we narrow this down? Well, just first of all, uh, we looked at a streamer hook on this just for a couple different reasons. Size is one, uh, easy to, to learn on, easy to see. Uh, streamer hooks are generally gonna be imitating bigger organisms, uh, whether it be a crayfish, a minnow, a leech, you know, something like that. Typically, a little longer shank, uh, and, and again, larger size. Uh, dry fly hooks will generally be matched to the size of the insect that you're imitating. Uh, in most cases, uh, they're gonna be lighter wire to help uh, aid in flotation. Uh, and you may find, again, you'll, well, you will find dry fly hooks down to very, very small sizes, you know, all the way down to 28, and even smaller. Uh, so they're generally gonna be much smaller, lighter wire, uh, and a lot more specific, I, I guess, application you could say. Uh, uh, nymph and wet fly hooks, again, are also gonna be sized more so to, uh, I think, a 
not necessarily a specific uh, insect or anything, but maybe a specific type of insect uh, of which there can be multiple species. Same is true for dry flies too. But dry or wet flies will be again a shorter shank hook often uh, and a heavier wire to help you know help the fly sink a little bit too. Uh, so streamer patterns or streamer hooks are bigger. Uh, size ranges, let's say on the average from uh, say eight to four or two, uh, longer shank length, uh, often a, a fairly heavy wire. Uh, dry fly hooks, uh, generally a shorter shank length, a lighter wire going down to very small sizes. Uh, wet fly nymph hooks, generally shorter shank, heavier wire, and generally not as small as what you'll find dry fly hooks for. So to try and kind of condense that a little bit into a couple paragraphs, uh, I hope that, you know, answered the question. Perfect. And, and, you know, we will dive into a lot of this as we progress and it'll all start to just become second nature. So I'm going to wrap it up. Al, Jerry, thank you so much. Um, Al, I hope you feel better. Jerry, you are a superstar for coming through last week. <laughs> well, uh, I'm glad I was able to help you, April. Good to talk to you again. Uh, Al, again, get better, buddy. Uh, hope, you're, uh, hope you're up and around soon. Yep, it's getting there. I appreciate you filling in, Jerry. You did a great job, and uh, it's good seeing you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you in a couple weeks.